Thank you, praise team. Wonderful message and song. <clears throat> the old uh, poem that was written years ago talks about God being the hound of heaven, how he continues to run after us and chase us down until finally we find out he's not going to hurt us. Instead, he's going to help us and give us life and that more abundantly. So today we want to talk about the journey. We've been going through Hebrews chapter 11, and uh, we could spend uh, several weeks in this one chapter alone. It's called the faith chapter, but uh, today we're going to kind of uh, hit the highlights about Father Abraham and uh, then quickly move on through chapter 11 and uh, start into chapter 12 next week. But uh, <clears throat> the book of Hebrews has been telling us about who Jesus is and that that we are to radiate Jesus and that he is uh, the exact representation of God and everything is summed up in him. He's, he's the great high priest. He's uh, the great king of uh, glory. He's the one who's above the angels. He's above all prince and <clears throat> principality and ruler in this world. And uh, everything points to Jesus as Messiah and Lord and king and master. And uh, so that involves us being willing to follow him and put our faith and trust in him so our lives can get hold of what God uh, wants for us in this world. Now, some of you have been following the Olympics down in Rio, and uh, you've <clears throat> seen a lot of the uh, great accomplishments of different athletes in different countries. And uh, I, I saw a Facebook post yesterday about... Um, the uh, soccer team in, in uh, Fiji, and uh, I think it was a soccer team, but they, rugby team in Fiji, and um, they uh, uh, won and beat Great Britain by a great number, and, and uh, they were out there on the field celebrating, and they were singing a hymn to God, a hymn of praise to God, and it was a wonderful testimony to, uh, to show a lot of these athletes who have faith and trust in Jesus. But one, one fellow that's really made a splash there in Rio, and I, I put a pun on that, uh, that is uh, Michael Phelps. Have you been following Michael Phelps at all? Um, Michael Phelps has uh, won all kinds of records. He's done a tremendous uh, job. And uh, for 2,000 years, a fellow named Leonidas had held the record for Olympic titles. And Michael Phelps finally tied Leonidas. And uh, this is a major accomplishment. And if I understand correctly, one more, he'll, he'll break the record that Leonidas had. But uh, he's already won uh, 22. Did he win his 23rd medal? He got his 23rd. Okay, so he got 20, he's had 23 gold medals. And it's an accomplishment that few others have ever even gotten close to, let alone achieved. And uh, it's, a, it's an amazing story about uh, Michael Phelps. And you've all seen uh, this cupping that they do where he has those little bruises on his back, little round circles, and uh, they were testifying to how that's an ancient remedy to kind of pull blood to the skin and, and make the muscles move better and so on. Uh, and some people have said, well, maybe his great comeback is due to this cupping method that they've used on his back. But don't you believe it for a minute. You see, the truth is that Michael Phelps has regained his purpose. That's why he's been successful. He's regained his purpose. Uh, Michael Phelps had went through a bad time after his last Olympics. He started downhill using drugs, involving himself in a party life. Uh, he came to a place where he was sitting in his room contemplating suicide, ready to end it all because he had lost purpose and meaning for his life. But uh, with the help of uh, rehab and the witness of Ray Lewis, who was with the Philadelphia Eagles football team, Michael Phelps <clears throat> regained his will to live. And so uh, Ray got him into rehab and Michael began to think about what he was doing. And as he uh, was there, Ray Lewis gave him a book called The Purpose Driven Life by Rick Warren, and we've studied that book here in our church as well. And as Michael Phelps uh, recovered from his drug issues and he began to read The Purpose Driven Life, he suddenly discovered what life was all about. 
he suddenly discovered it's not about winning gold medals. He suddenly discovered that his life had purpose and meaning beyond gold medals. And by recovering that purpose, he now realizes he can go out and, and achieve all to the glory of God and not to the glory of Michael Phelps or trying to impress the world. And I believe that's the reason for Michael Phelps' success in the Olympics this time. And I'm glad that he's achieved so well in, in what he's done. But you know, that's his story. And as we go in today's passage, I want you to understand that we all have a story. We all have a story. And you can follow along in, in our handout this morning and, and uh, follow along as we go through this passage today. But I, I just want you to know, as we journey through life, we compose our story. We're all putting together our story. And you might say, well, I don't, I'm not composing anything. Yes, you are. Every choice you make, every thought you do, every action you accomplish, every attempt at doing something, every failure, everything that you decide not to do, every consequence to every choice that you make, it's composing your own story, your life story. And every one of us has a life story. Some may be out in the front of the world like Michael Phelps, and others may just be quiet, behind-the-scenes stories that no one else ever sees except immediate family and friends. But you all have a story, and you're all composing that story. And, and, and we need to understand that God has a story, too. God has a story, too. And, and God's story has a, a beginning, a middle, and an end, except God's story continues on forever, too. And, and so it would uh, make sense for us to find out what God's story is and how we connect to that story. You see, the secret of our journey is to connect our story with God's story. Amen. If you really want to know what life's about, you connect your story with God's story. And suddenly life has sense and meaning to it and purpose to it. And as uh, Abraham went on a journey of faith, he realized that he was fulfilling God's bigger story, God's bigger purposes for this world. And, and so today we want to find out that we can begin a journey of faith that connects with God's eternal purposes. That, that's what we're looking at. Your journey of faith, how it connects with God's eternal purposes purposes. We said uh, last week that God's people are on a journey of faith, and the Apostle Paul said it this way, uh, that this journey is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. Notice, it's from first to last, beginning, middle, and end, but it all has to do with faith, because the righteous person, the just person, will live by faith. And so your story, if it's going to connect to God's story, has to have faith in the one that made us, and in the one who sent his son, and in the one who has an eternal story. And as you put your faith and trust in him, then suddenly your journey has meaning and purpose. So how do we live out our journey of faith? How do we do that? Well, that's what Abraham's story here in Hebrews 11 is all about. First of all, we see that people of faith look ahead to a promised land. People of faith look ahead to a promised land. And, and Abraham certainly was looking ahead because he was satisfied where he was living. He was in his own country, the Ur of the Chaldees. And suddenly God said, hey, Abraham, I want you to go on a journey. I want you to leave your home, leave your relatives, and I want you to go to a country you don't know. And so Abraham had a choice. What am I going to do with my life journey? Am I going to follow God's call or not? You see, God called Abraham out of his own country to go to a place that he would inherit. And that was the promise, you see. God said, you're going to get a new land. I promise you a new land, but you've got to leave your own country to find that new land, to, to come to this place you're going to inherit. And Abraham believed God, and he went on that journey of faith. He trusted God. He believed what God said to him. It says there in Hebrews 11:8, 8, 
By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. You see, last week we said that, that faith is not just belief in the unknown or, or belief in something you can't see, although those things might be involved. Uh, faith actually is belief in the God who asks you to do something. And so you're trusting God, you're trusting his character, and you're believing that he is going to do the very best for you, and he knows what's the best for you. And so when God tells you to do something, you don't say, that doesn't make any sense to me. You say, God, I trust you because I know you, and therefore I'm going to do it even though I don't fully understand it. You see the difference? It doesn't depend on whether we reason it out or understand it. It depends on whether we trust God or not. And, and if I'm a father and, and my little toddler's running toward the street and I see a car coming down and I say to the little toddler, stop! That toddler could say, well, do I trust my dad or not? Hmm, doesn't make sense to me why I shouldn't go into that street. And the toddler just keeps on going and gets hit by the car. But if the toddler says, I know my dad, and he's not screaming for me to stop for no reason at all, the toddler's going to stop, and suddenly the car wishes past him. You see, the difference is not trying to reason out the circumstances. It's trusting the one who tells you what you need to do. That's the difference. And so Abraham was willing to go to a place he didn't know about because he trusted the God who sent him there. And that's what faith is all about, putting your faith and trust in the one in whom we believe, knowing that he has the very best in mind for each and every one of us. Abraham obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. And God still does this today. God still calls people to do things they're not expecting. <clears throat> it might be that your company begins to downsize, and they say to you, uh, we're going to relocate our company, and you're a valued employee, and we would like you to go with us, but it means you're going to have to leave where you are right here and uproot your family and, and move to another part of the country or to another country altogether nowadays, as my brother-in-law had to make a decision about. And you're going to have to decide, is this something God is wanting me to do? You see, God still calls us in unusual ways like that. God still calls out people to go preach. God still calls out missionaries. God still calls out people to say, well, rather than run the rat race and try to earn a lot of money, I'm going to give my life to civil service, or I'm going to give my life to a nonprofit group, or I'm going to give my life <clears throat> to the ministry because they felt the call of God on their lives. And they don't fully understand it, but they're willing to do it. Because they trust the God who has called them, just like Abraham did. You see, Abraham lived by faith as a stranger and pilgrim in the land, and he never personally received the promised land. You ever thought about that? Abraham went, he obeyed God, <clears throat> he went into the very land that God promised he would inherit, but he never received it, did he? He never received it. Matter of fact, <clears throat> his son and his son after him didn't receive it either. It, it was another generation, several times down, that finally came into the promised land. So Abraham never received the land that had been promised to him. But what did he do in the meantime? He lived as a stranger and a pilgrim in the land. He lived in the tents and he roamed around. And he trusted God where he was in those circumstances. And, and you see, that's really the cusp of what faith is all about. It means that Everything doesn't have to work out exactly like I expect it to or like I think it's going to. Everything just has to work out on a day-by-day -day basis because I'm trusting God. And wherever he tells me to go, I'll go. Whatever he tells me to do, I'll do. And that's the way Abraham lived his life. He was a nomad, a pilgrim, a wanderer, a sojourner in a land that he had been promised that he would inherit and his family would inherit forever. Notice what it says in verses 9 and 13. By faith, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, 
as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. Then verse 13, all these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance, admitting that they were foreigners and strangers on earth. Now, now this, is a, this is a real deep understanding of what faith's all about. You see, when God makes a promise to us, we believe it because he's God. Not because it comes true immediately. And, and we begin to put our lives in God's hands day by day, moment by moment, believing he's going to accomplish his purposes through us even if ultimately we don't receive what had been promised. We believe God's big enough to fulfill his promise, but we're willing also to trust him with our daily lives so we don't have to say, I have tangible proof it's going to come true. And so three generations went through this process. They looked ahead in the distance about what God was going to do, and they believed God, even though they lived as pilgrims, as strangers in a strange land. Now, that's pretty deep faith, isn't it? Trusting God that way. And yet that's the same kind of life we're supposed to live. You see, the world promises us a lot of things. The world says if you do things my way, you do things our way, you're going to get all this, all this wealth, all this, am all this uh, power, all this uh, fulfillment of ambition and desires and wants. And, and if you fall for that, ultimately you're going to get disappointed. But if, if you trust God with your life, and you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, what's Jesus say? All these things will be added unto you. So our goal is constantly, like Abraham, to put God first. And sometimes that means we're not going to get the treasures of the world or get the glory of the world. But it does mean we're going to be obedient to God and have a relationship with him. That lasts forever. You see, Abraham looked beyond, beyond an earthly home <clears throat> to the city of God, which is his heavenly home. Ultimately, Abraham said, hey, you know, it's not about getting the land of Canaan as my own, even though that's been promised to me. I'm also looking for a heavenly home that's even farther beyond anything on earth because he knew that God was preparing a place for him. Jesus told his disciples, look, I'm going to prepare a place for you, and I'll come back for you. And so it's been the same process with Abraham, as Jesus promised his disciples. What does it say here in the scripture? He was looking forward to the city with foundations whose architect and builder is God. He knew there's something beyond this earthly world that we live in. And so... Um, the scripture goes on in verses 14 through 16. People who say such things show they are looking for a country of their own. If they had been thinking of the country they left, they would have had opportunity to return. Instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he's prepared a city for them. Ultimately, as a pilgrim on this earth, as we're sojourning on this earth, our ultimate goal is to be in a relationship with God forever. And God promises us he's preparing us a heavenly home. He's preparing us a place, a heavenly city for you and for me, each and every one of us who are willing to put our faith and trust in him. You know, when uh, Augustine, the famous theologian and, and bishop of Hippo there in North Africa, uh, he and others were receiving news that the barbarians were, were coming down from the north and they were sacking Rome. Rome was being destroyed. This great empire that had covered all the Mediterranean was now falling apart. And people were despairing because if the empire falls, what's going to happen to us? And even Christians were saying, if the empire falls, what's going to happen to us? Just like they're saying, if Donald Trump gets elected president, what's going to happen to us? Or Hillary Clinton gets elected president, what's going to happen? They thought the world was falling apart. So what did Augustine do? Augustine said, we don't put our faith in Rome. We don't put our faith in a worldly empire. 
All those things will pass away. And so he wrote a book. You can still read it today. It's called The City of God. And he said, we are sojourners on this earth just like Father Abraham. And we're looking forward to that day when we have a new heaven and a new earth, a city of God that will be ours for eternity. And so as we live our life, we don't live for the Roman Empire. We live our life for the heavenly kingdom. And so by faith, we look forward to the coming city, the new Jerusalem. And one day, we'll see it descending from above. When God decides that he's had enough and Jesus comes again, the heavenly city will come. It'll be a part of the new heaven and the new earth that you and I will experience. It's the city of God that we look forward to. So we, by faith, look forward to this coming city of God, this new Jerusalem. John the Apostle wrote these words. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. So Christian, the world may be a terrible mess. And you may think America is going down the tubes. And you may think the world is going to be taken over by Muslims. And you may feel like terrorism is just so rampant that we don't have any hope. But let me tell you something. The world is passing away. And all things will become new because God is preparing a new heaven and a new earth. And one day there will be a heavenly city, a new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven. And we'll be a part of that city of God. That's the hope we have, just like Abraham had hope. People of faith look ahead to a promised land. But also we see from Abraham that people of faith trust in a promised son. We trust in a promised son. Now, you remember the story. Abraham and Sarah were promised a child in their old age, weren't they? They were promised a child. Abraham was 100. Sarah was in her late 90s. And uh, the angels came by to go, go down to Sodom and Gomorrah to destroy it and and uh, they said something to the effect of this year, next year, this time, um, <clears throat> Sarah will have delivered a uh, child. And Sarah laughed. And they said, why did she laugh? Well, I didn't laugh, she said. Yes, you did. And so Abraham and Sarah heard this promise, this promise that they were going to have a child, and they were both old people. They were both old people. And, and they said, how is this going to happen? It's impossible. But by faith, they trusted God to complete his promise that all the nations of the earth would be blessed by Abraham's offspring. You see, when God called Abraham out of Ur of the Chaldees and he went on to Canaan and he got there, God showed him all the stars of heaven. And he said, Abraham, one day all your descendants will be as many as the stars in heaven. They'll be as many as the, the uh, sand on the seashore. And Abraham didn't have any kids at that time. Eventually he had Ishmael, but, but he wasn't the child of promise. No, there's another child who is coming. And God promised that child to Abraham and Sarah. And so they believed God. They trusted him. Notice what it says in verses 11 and 12. And by faith, even Sarah, who was past childbearing age, was enabled to bear children because she considered him faithful who had made the promise. And so from this one man, and he as good as dead, came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as countless as the sand on the seashore. God fulfilled his promise to this couple. And, and now we look back and see generation after generation of descendants from the line of Abraham. And, and we see that God uh, was able to fulfill the promise he had given to this couple. You see, Abraham and Sarah saw uh, their salvation through a promised son. They, they saw that they would have a future in this promised son. And, and as a matter of fact, uh, that promise was passed down from generation to generation. If you have your Bibles open there in chapter 11, uh, it goes on to talk about Moses, about how he refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a short time. And in verse 26, he regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ 
as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt because he was a looking ahead to his reward. What had happened? This promise of a son now became the promise of a future Messiah, the Christ. And, and Moses said, I'm willing to reject Egypt and all of its uh, rewards and all the, all the things that I could gain as a child of Pharaoh. I reject it all for the sake of suffering with the kingdom of God and looking forward to the future Messiah. And, and so Abraham and Sarah were promised this child, and they saw salvation in that child, and that, that promise of a future Messiah began to be placed into their family line, and they began to look forward to a coming Messiah, a coming child who would rescue them all. You see, Abraham's descendant became the savior of the world. As we look back now, we can see that that happened, can't we? We are blessed, and we become part of God's family when we put our faith and trust in the promised Messiah. And we know him as Jesus, Jesus Christ, Jesus the Messiah. And Abraham and Sarah were looking forward. Moses was looking forward. But we, now we can look back and see how Jesus fulfilled all the predictions, all the prophecies, all the promises of God for the coming Messiah. And because Jesus fulfilled those, now we can put our faith and trust in this promised son, this promised Messiah. And now we have hope because of that. You see, John 3.16 kind of just summarizes all that. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. So the promise of a son to Abraham and Sarah suddenly became the promise of a son for all of us. Someone who would be their descendant would be the one who would be the Savior. And God gave us that son. He gave us Jesus. And when we believe in him, we have eternal life. Have you put your faith and trust in that Savior? Have you put your faith and trust in that promised son? You see, they, they looked ahead and we looked back to a promised son for salvation. There's one final thing we see in this passage. And that is people of faith hope in a promised resurrection. We hope in a promised resurrection. <clears throat> when you're on this journey, there's going to be many trials and sacrifices. And, and as a journey of faith, it's not promised to be easy. It's going to be difficult as you go along in this life. But the person of faith relies on God no matter what the test at hand. No matter what the test at hand. And you're going to face trials in your life where you say, God, do you still love me? Are you there, God? Why am I going through this, God? All, all of you are going to face that at some point in your life. And, and that's the test. <coughs> that's where God says, I want you to trust me more than your circumstances. I want you to believe I'm bigger than anything that comes your way. I want your absolute love and devotion. And that's what Abraham had to face. And he faced it in a way that, that none of us ever dreamed would happen. But certainly he didn't dream it would happen this way. But yet God asked him to do something that looking back on it now, we, we just kind of ask ourselves, why would God do that? In, in verses 17 and 18 it says, By faith Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had embraced the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son, even though God had said to him, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. And so here's this story in Genesis. Scholars still debate it. They, they still talk about it. They, they try to analyze it, try to understand it, and they really can't reason it out. But basically, God said to Abraham, Abraham, I promised you a son, and you have your son. But Abraham, I'm going to ask you to sacrifice your son now and give him back to me. Now, put yourself in Abraham's shoes. Wait a minute. God, you said that I would have a son, and all the nations on earth would be blessed with this son. You're going to ask me to kill him?
you're going to face a test like that in your life. It's not going to be exactly like Abraham had to face, but it's going to be a test that's going to say, do you trust God more than your circumstances? And so Abraham said, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. And he agreed to take his son for a sacrifice. Now, tradition has it <coughs> that they went on a journey several days away from where they were, and they went to a place called Mount Moriah. And Mount Moriah traditionally happens to be the same mountain where Jesus was crucified. And Abraham walked up that mountain, got the wood for the fire, left the servant behind, and he and Isaac walked on. And Isaac said, we have the wood, but where's the sacrifice? And Abraham said, the Lord will provide the sacrifice for us. And so he built the altar, and he laid Isaac on the altar, and was about ready to take Isaac's life. And God intervened. And they had a ram caught in the thicket. And Abraham, <clears throat> God says, use that ram as a sacrifice. Now I know that you love me and you're willing to obey me and follow me. And so a substitute ram was put in the place of Isaac. But Abraham is willing to give up his own son. And, and we'll find out why here in just a second. But, but the point is this, is that Abraham obeyed God even though the circumstances were beyond his understanding. And he was obedient to God no matter what the cost might be. Verse 19, we find this. Abraham trusted God so much that he believed God would raise his son from the dead in order to fulfill his promise. Genesis 22.5 says that Abraham looked to his servant before they went up on the mountain. And he said to his servant, you wait here. My son and I will return to you shortly. Now, if you just read that quickly, you'd miss that in the Old Testament. But Abraham said that to his servant because Abraham believed that even if he sacrificed Isaac, God would raise him back from the grave. He had that much faith in God because he knew God's character. He knew God's not a capricious God who, who does things without reasons. That he didn't understand why God wanted this to happen, but he knew that his son Isaac was going to come back and that servant would see him again. He believed that God was going to fulfill his promise that all the nations of the earth would be blessed through this son. And verse 19, it says, Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead. And so in a manner of speaking, he did receive Isaac back from death. What a wonderful testimony to Abraham's faith. That he was willing to believe that God is a resurrection God. That God brings resurrection life from that which seems to be dead, from that which is dead. And, and no matter what situation you're in, no matter how bad the circumstances, you can always point to the story and realize that God will resurrect you in your situation. If you understood what I just said, would you nod your head? No matter how bad you are, no matter where you're at, no matter how despairing it seems, God can raise you up from that situation. Right? And I'm telling you, you're going to face that kind of test in your life. And you've got to make a decision like Abraham did. Do I trust God or do I trust my circumstances? And I'm not wishing any bad circumstances on anybody. It's just that life itself is such you're going to face those circumstances. What insurance adjusters tell us we go through five major catastrophes in our lives? You're going to face it somehow. You're going to face it. But I'm here to tell you, just like Abraham could testify, that God will raise you up in those circumstances. Now, the wonderful thing about following Jesus is this, that when it looked the worst when Jesus was crucified and placed in the grave for three days. It looked like the devil had won. It looked like evil had won. It looked like death had won. It looked like sin had won. It looked like all the powers that be had won. But yet three days later, what did God do? He raised Jesus from the grave, didn't he? 
He raised him from the grave. And now Jesus proves that he is the child, the son of God, the promised one, the Messiah. And he has the power to give us life, eternal life. You see, God raised Jesus from the dead, so, so we have hope for the future. We have hope. <coughs> no matter what happens around us, we have hope. We have hope no matter what happens to us personally. We have hope because we have a living Lord, a living Savior, someone who is risen from the grave. In John eleven twenty five, 25, <coughs> Jesus was looking and talking to Mary or Martha, I think it was Martha, and he says, where did they lay him? Because her brother Lazarus had died. And she said, Lord, if you'd been here sooner, my brother wouldn't have died. But, but Jesus looked to her and he said, I am the resurrection and life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. Do you believe this? And she said, yes, Lord, I believe. What Jesus was saying was this. Death doesn't have the final word. Defeat doesn't have the final word. That, that God is in control, no matter what your circumstances. That God's a resurrection God. That God's the one who raises us up. And when we put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, we have this ultimate hope. <coughs> that even though we die, that's not the end. That we have a future. Because Jesus has been risen from the grave. And he will raise us up from the grave as well. And we will live with him forever and forever. Do you have that kind of hope? There's some people who think this is all we get. Look around. <coughs> that's, that's why they, they just go for the gusto in life. Trying to live life to the fullest. And make a shambles of their life. Because they think this is it. But Christians understand this. No. Our life is to be lived in such a way that we do what God wants. And we put our faith and trust in Jesus. And that ultimately, even though we die, we'll be raised again. And we'll live with God forever and forever. Because we've latched ourselves on to God's story. It's not just about my story. It's about being a part of his story, his purposes for this world. So you're on this journey, just like Abraham was. Who are you going to attach your wagon to? Let's pray. Father, hear our voice. <clears throat> Each one of us are on a journey. May this be the day where we attach our lives to you. Through Jesus, the promised Son. Amen. We're going to stand to sing, and you come as we sing.